So, a few examples of uh, cloud computing, uh, just to get you warm, or not cloud computing, but big data. Walmart is uh, really good at uh, data management. They actually make more uh, or as much money on uh, data mining as they do on uh, selling retail. Uh, things like um, figuring out if we uh, put the display of one item from one vendor uh, half a meter further out into the, the ale, um, what is the effect on sales? And you ran this ad in this local newspaper in this small region, what is the effect on sales on that ad compared to this other ad and so on. So data mining is a really important part of what Walmart do. And also figuring out uh, how to do uh, real-time pricing of items is part of that data mining bit. So, for example, after Hurricane Sandy, uh, for some reason, they re they saw quickly that uh, the demand for strawberry pop tarts. I don't know why Americans started buying strawberry pop tarts because there's a hurricane going on, but that's Americans for you. Um, but they Walmart saw this and could uh, adjust the prices accordingly uh, to meet that demand. Uh, so this and this is of course something that they need to do in real time uh, figuring out this is going on now we need to adjust the prices now it's not a matter of two weeks later figuring out that oh we should have raised the prices then rolls royce is one example if you look at uh, scania for example the swedish uh, um, uh, truck company uh, they do the same things they today they collect all sorts of uh, telemetry from their engines Rolls-Royce does it for airplanes, uh, Scania does it for uh, the, the uh, truck engines, and collect tens of terabytes of data for each, in Scania's case, it's for the running engines. So you have a, have a truck driving around in, uh, in the middle of Brazil, and it sends data, telemetry data, to Scania for analysis. Uh, and and I, I would surmised or I would guess that Rolls-Royce does the same with their jet engines but especially when they simulate it when they test the, the engines there's an enormous amount of information that is generated from uh, just measuring what's going on in an engine vibrations wear and tear usage of uh, fuel and other uh, consumables so all sorts of measurements are done in these engines So those, those two, uh, if you look at Walmart, it's a matter of that you get velocity in there. You get plenty of, you need to act quickly on the data that you get. In Rolls-Royce case, it's volume. Uh, it's the amount of data that you need to deal with. And then you have things like medical, uh, where you have handwritten doctor notes that are going to, that you need to be able to extract information from. You have natural language and you need to figure out what's actually being said in a conversation, for example, in natural language. Uh, so understanding the variety of data uh, and getting the information out of that data is an important thing. Um, Shazam. I don't know if you've heard of that music service. It's uh, you basically can. Uh, it's an app, I think, that you. Uh, if you're wondering what song is playing right now, you you hold up your phone and let it listen to that song, and it'll match that to a database and say that well, it's this song by that and that artist. Um, that's actually an interesting case uh, uh, because the similarities between how Shazam does, does this and what you're going to do in the big data analytics assignment is uh, striking. So uh, watch that YouTube video. Uh, it's quite interesting to see uh, and you, you might learn a few ideas on how to work with the uh, um, assignment in this course. There are of course plenty other assignment uh, examples here as well. Um, Shen et al. studied uh, big data um, in well, mobile network applications in particular, but they looked in, in general things and looked at the amount of data and it's staggering how much data is generated today uh, for no reason at all. And that's one of the problems is that we get all of this data and but the information content is low there. Um, but having this much data means that we have challenges when 
we want to deal with it. And I'll come back to them, uh, I think, later on this presentation. Uh, I'll start with a brief reflection uh, just about words. So the English word computer uh, puts sort of the emphasis on computation. You have algorithms, mathematics, code cracking and so on. That's computers for you. Um, Sweden, for some reason, went with the word uh, data processor instead. And today, if we look at how computers are used, it's more about data processing than it is about computing. Uh, so information systems, it's full with all sorts of other different connotations, but information systems is more uh, closer to what uh, most computer systems today work on. So it's information that needs to be managed somehow. And as an example, I take, took a look at my own uh, photo library. Um, but actually, let's start before that. So as a kid, I had uh, 160 kilobyte floppy disks. You know these big five and a quarter inch uh, disks that you could, uh, uh, well, maybe you've never seen them, but uh, yes. that's what I, uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> so I started out with them. And that was, oh, that much, how am I going to fill this? That was my question then. How am I going to fill 160 kilobytes? It's going to last forever. I had two or three of them and I thought oh, that's plenty. Uh, my first hard drive was 10 megabytes. Sounded like a jet engine when I started it. And it was really, really slow. Today I think I can download uh, magnitudes more uh, information uh, from the internet uh, faster than what I could uh, read a file from that hard drive. Um, as a student we had a hard quota of 12 megabytes, we had a soft quota actually of 6 megabytes. So you had 6 megabytes and then if you went above that you had uh, 7 days in order to get below that uh, those 6 megabytes uh, again, otherwise was, your account was locked. Uh, but we could never store more than 12 megabytes. Um, and then I looked at my photo collection. So in 2005, I had, uh, so all the photos we as a family took then uh, is 375 megabytes. And then it's been growing year by year. Uh, so last year I looked and it's 50 gigabytes of new photos taken. Um, just because camera resolution, we, t we, we have camera availability. You, have, you don't have a dedicated camera anymore. You have it in uh, your phones. It's always there. You take pictures and you take a couple of pictures because, well, storage space is cheap. Uh, uh, the camera resolution is uh, so much better, uh, but also requires more storage space. So this is a personal story into big data. And it's still really big, 50 gigabytes. That's nothing today, right? Um, but it's getting together. Uh, this is getting a problem for me because I can't just, uh, or I still can, but I'm nearing the point where I can no longer run my own backup solution at home. Uh, because finding reliable disks to fit all this data on uh, is getting more and more difficult and more and more expensive for me. Yeah, I have other challenges as well. Um, if I want to look at my photos, of course I need network capacity for that. If I uh, upgrade to a new backup solution or copy the files. Just copying the files takes forever these days uh, because the network is uh, a bottleneck then. If I'm looking for a particular photo, how do I do that? How do, what, what should I look for? When, what are my uh, uh, criteria for finding a particular photo? How do I index that information? So um, the, the, the amount of photos means that it's more difficult to me to find my way around it. On the other hand, it also probably means that I don't need to find it, that exact, that one picture that was good, because I have 20 pictures somewhere around there that was equally good. Uh, so maybe I, I don't need to find that particular one picture anymore, which I can make, I can use to my advantage then. So in, in big data, we talk about uh, four V's of big data. Uh, some articles throw in a few more V's just because uh, they thought it was a good idea uh, with alliteration. Uh, 
we talk about the volume, the amount of data, and we talk about velocity, the speed at which data is generated, which is the speed we need to process it in most of the time, and the variety that we have different types of data. We have structured data, like in a, an old uh, SQL database. We have semi-structured and we have unstructured, like natural language conversations or whatever. Uh, we have old uh, um, um, church records and stuff like that that are being uh, processed these days. Um, is it numbers? Is it uh, floating numbers? Is it integers? Is it text? Is it audio? Is it video? Is it something else altogether? So we have all sorts of data and sometimes all of them are together in one uh, piece of information. For example, you might have uh, a video, you might have a thumbnail of that video and you might have uh, uh, captions, text captions of what's going on in the video. So all of that, that might be related to the same piece of information it should be dealt with together somehow, but there's different types of information for the same, uh, or t different types of data for the same information. And then the last V is value. Um, well, it's sort of the holy grail of big data is that there is large value in there. We just need to find it. That's the big problem that the density of uh, information uh, and value is low. Uh, figuring out what is valuable and what is just noise is really important. So challenges, um, representing the data, so storing it and analyzing it uh, in terms of um, how should we store different types of data? How should we structure it so that we can do some form, form of meaningful analysis of it? So uh, just collecting it is one thing and then storing it in such a way that we can actually make use of it later is important. Um, finding out that this information we already have, so we don't need to store it again. And finding out that this is actually, this is the same information or uh, the same data, but new information. So we should store that. That's equally important. Uh, so as an example, if I do, uh, if I have a sensor somewhere, uh, let's say a temperature sensor, and I sample it once every 10 minutes and see that the temperature out is, uh, well, it's nine degrees today, right? So I, tense, I, uh, I test that and I test that every 10 minutes and I get it, ah, it's nine degrees, it's nine degrees, it's nine degrees. Uh, that is in some sense redundant information because temperature doesn't change that quickly, at least not here. So I don't really need to store that the temperature hasn't changed. But in some other instances, uh, maybe it's really important that the temperature does stay the same. If I'm measuring the temperature of my uh, car engine, for example, it's really important that I, I, that I see that the temperature is constant and not changing. Um, so the same data there, temperature is the same as uh, 10 seconds ago, is important to store because that's information that's important for me. Whereas if I look at the temperature, the weather temperature, uh, that, is, that the temperature is the same now as it was 10 minutes ago, that's not information, that's just expected. It's more important than to store when the temperature does change. So figuring out uh, um, what is actual information and what is just repeated the same information, that's important in order to uh, uh, not store too much, not have, uh, giving me more work to do than is necessary. So thinking about this already in the collection phase and in the uh, storage phase means that it, my analysis will be easier later on. So I have all my data and I do an analysis of it and I come to different conclusions. But then when is the time to do redo that analysis? When do I have enough new data that I need to redo my analysis? And when I redo my analysis, what data has been become obsolete and should be culled from my data set and what uh, information should, or what data should be kept? So that's data lifecycle management. 
and then making sure that I can grow as my uh, the amount of data grows. Uh, I should be able to deal to grow along with it in my analysis mechanisms. Uh, and then the, the actual mechanism, well, heterogeneous data, uh, different types, figuring out how to analyze that, and often in limited time. Um, not, not, not always real time. I don't always have to have an answer immediately, but it at least is limited time. I don't have a, all the time in the world. My old math teacher said once that if you give me a big enough abacus and an infinite amount of time, I can do whatever you can do with your pesky computers. Um, well, the infinite amount of time is the key there. We don't have that. And the next bit is that with these big data sets, we probably want to have the, at least the ability to cooperate on it, analyze it from different perspectives, sharing it with other people, sharing it with at least different parts of our own organization uh, so that we can make the most use of it as possible. This goes back to the value. If I have this huge data set and I only analyze it from one perspective, well, well, that's one piece of value I can get out of it. But the more different analysis I can put to, uh, on my data set, the more value I, can, I might be able to find. And that means that I need to cooperate on it. <clears throat> and that means that I need to have an infrastructure in place that allows other people to cooperate and work with the same data set. Next bit is confidentiality. Um, what private information is in the data set? Uh, what about intellectual property, licenses, and so on? Security, how do I make sure that no one, uh, no one unauthorized can get access to my data set? Um, and then the last bit, energy management. This is becoming increasingly important. Uh, there are measures now, I don't remember them uh, from the top of my head, about how much energy is uh, required to train a neural network to do analysis. So the analysis might be relatively energy efficient, but training the neural networks to do that analysis is actually coming up as an, an important consumer of uh, power today. Um, Bitcoin mining is 1% of the world's energy production is used for Bitcoin mining today. That's 1%. It's ridiculous. Um, so energy management of big data is going to be really important in figuring out, and that, that goes to, if we can avoid to do some, some analysis, well, that means that we can reduce our energy, foot, energy footprint. We can be, if we can be more efficient, if we have a more efficient solution for doing something, we can become more energy efficient as well. Uh, so those are, go, those are important things to look at. And it's not about, uh, not only about saving the world, it's also about that uh, uh, the power grids aren't always equipped to deal with those analysis. So there's a big debate today in Sweden, or this, uh, well, this autumn in Sweden has been about, uh, I think, uh, Amazon starting their own their new data, data center somewhere in Sweden. I think Facebook had a new data center somewhere in Sweden as well. and they are beginning to realize that those data centers consume as much energy as the city near where they are uh, located. And the power grids can't feed both the data center and the city at the same time. So uh, those are being becoming important things as well. So the value chain, we generate data somehow, we collect from sensors, we collect from uh, users, users type in uh, reviews of uh, items on Amazon, for example, or something. So we generate data somehow. That's the easy bit, figuring out, uh, collecting data today is, there's no shortage of data. Um, Problem usually is to figure out, uh, as I've said, which data to which is actually meaningful to you, for you to collect. Today, the strategy is mostly that, well, let's collect everything, throw an artificial intelligence uh, algorithm at it and see what pops up. Uh, so we have no idea about uh, correlation or causality, causality, but we think that an AI network can figure that out for us. 
if we only give it to throw enough data at it. So collecting data is no problem today. Um, generating data is no problem either today. It's easy, it's, uh, sensors are cheap. Um, and then we have, once we have the generated data, we uh, collect it, we transmit it into our system. We do some bit of pre-processing, filter away the most uh, obviously redundant data. Uh, we might do some compression, we might reformat it into some structure that is easy for us to work with later on. And then it's a matter of storing it. Um, somehow on hard drives, uh, network connected hard drives, different distributed file st systems, uh, databases of some sort. Um, in order for us to make it accessible for the analysis. And then it's the, you have the analysis and the analysis we will make use of uh, parallel processing, distributed parallel processing, uh, a lot of, or I advocate at least that uh, we should also take a step back and look at the data and look at the problem and see, can we solve this in a different way? Uh, is there a smarter way of solving this? Rather than just throwing more computing power at the problem, we, if we have, if we redefine the problem to be a different problem, then maybe we can get away with a much less uh, computing power. So with cloud computing, we have, well, we have distributed storage. That's one of the things that cloud computing uh, promises or um, markets. We have parallel computing. We have flexible resource scheduling management. We can uh, spin up new machines and uh, new storage facilities when we need them, and we can uh, take them offline when we no longer need them. And we only pay for when they are online. And we have tools in place to monitor the health of our application and uh, uh, the machines, are they up and running? Are they healthy? Are they working along or have they gotten stuck somewhere? Uh, those are the things that we will more or less get for free in any cloud provider. Well, not for free, but we're going to get the, this tool set in from a cloud provider. Uh, so those are things that will make our life working with big data uh, much easier. Um, examples of these things, we have Hadoop HDFS, for example, is one distributed file system. So Hadoop is being marketed as this big analysis, parallel analysis uh, thingy. Many companies use it only for the distributed file system component and use that uh, and don't care that much about the parallel computing thing. Uh, so that's what, one example, there are plenty others. Um, if we do want parallel processing, uh, and if we do want to use Hadoop, well, we have uh, computing paradigms like MapReduce uh, that enables us to do parallel processing of things. And Hadoop MapReduce is then a distributed version of that. So MapReduce, I don't know if you have programmed uh, Lisp anything. Uh, it's one of the classic or it's an integral part of the tool set in Lisp is that I have a list of things and I want to apply a function to each element in that list. That's called a map function. So I map a function onto each element on the list and I get a new list, which is uh, whatever happened when I apply that function to each element of the original list. That's a map. Reduce is then I take this list and I combine the elements in some way down to a single answer or might be a very complex answer, but it's a single answer and it is somehow anyway. So that's a reduce operation. So I don't have as many elements in the list after a reduce as I had uh, when I started. Whereas in a map, I have as many elements. I've just applied a function to them. So do, using this, I can uh, process data uh, and conceptual at least, I, I process data. So each element is processed concurrently to every other element. Uh, so that's the map reduce paradigm. And it's, as I said, at Lisp, uh, you have that built into the language. You don't need to worry, it's already there. Uh, the distributed map reduce 
it's actually an easy extension to do in Common Lisp at least, but uh, if you don't have access to that, well, then you need to get working with, for example, Hadoop uh, to do a distributed MapReduce. So those are tools that are going to be, uh, that are used very much in order to do big data analysis and using the cloud uh, resources to do big data analy analysis. Um, some challenges there um, is, well, do I need to do real-time analysis uh, or can I get away with offline analysis? Do I need to have my answer immediately uh, or can I uh, do batch processing, for example? Can I do real-time analysis? That's a problem in itself. Do I need to have access to the entire data set before I can start my analysis? Well, then I can't do real-time analysis, even if I need to, if, even if I want to. Then I need to do offline analysis. Same thing, can I deal with each piece of datum as it's in its own, or do I need to have uh, this, the whole set of data available to me in order to do the analysis? Then I need to have it in memory, I, I suppose. Uh, and can I fit my data set into memory or a big enough chunk of the data set into my memory so I can do my analysis? That connects to can I parallelize it? Do I, can I actually look at each datum in separately or do I need to look at them as a whole? And how do I test this work before I deploy it to my, uh, my cloud solution? How do I make sure that I have a working solution that is efficient enough uh, so that I can actually deploy that and don't have to pay for testing that online. And once I've got all of this working, how do I make sure that when I start my cloud service, my, my, or my virtual machines on the cloud, uh, that they are provisioned in the same way so that what I, whatever I tested locally, I can be confident will work on the cloud as well. And when I share my solution to my friends or my colleagues, whatever, how can I make sure that they have the same starting point as I did? That's repeatable provisioning for you. Uh, and a few other challenges that you don't see that much about in the uh, literature. They just sort of assume that, well, it's there. They wave their hands magically and say that, well, this is also there. It's actually uploading the data. Uh, so if you're going to use, for example, Hadoop MapReduce, well, Hadoop expects the data to be, uh, if you're running it in distributed mode, it expects the data to be in HDFS. And how do you get it there? That might take as much time as doing the actual anal analysis. And sometimes you need to reformat the data, you need to process the data in such a way that you can um, actually get, get it into Hadoop. And that will take time. So uploading the data is an important first step, which is often overlooked. Uh, and once you're up and running with your uh, nice cloud solution, uh, you realize that, well, you provisioned your machines so that you could uh, run them at full throttle uh, for a while. And uh, if you were able to do that, you would have the analysis done in the timeframes that you set up. Well. Amazon, for example, uses something called CPU throttling. So you get a number of uh, CPU credits for every uh, hour you don't run your machine uh, at more than a certain load. Um, and when you do run the machine at uh, above that load, it consumes those credits per minute, I think. So uh, um, running a machine at full throttle for 10 minutes means that you consume all the credits that you're allowed to have, and then they start to throttle the machine so you don't get the computing speed that you need anymore. So you need to uh, think about these things when you uh, uh, decide which platform that you need, what, how many servers you need, what the size of those machines are going to be, and so on, because you're not really allowed to use all of that computing power if you go with Amazon, for example. Chaos Monkey is something that Netflix deploys. Basically, it's a piece of software that runs around on their live platform and randomly kills things. Um, might uh, fake a CPU break, might uh, uh, kill the dis access to the hard drive for one particular machine and so on. Uh, and the idea with this is that things will break. Just the fact that if you have a cloud solution and you use uh, 
well, it doesn't really matter what type of uh, hardware you use. Uh, the sheer volume of that hardware means that statistically something will break. Uh, you don't know what, you don't know if it's going to be the CPU, the hard drive, the RAM, or uh, the network or what. Something is going to break just because you have so many servers running. So what Netflix does is that they force this. This chaos monkey means makes sure that things break more often than they otherwise should. Uh, and that means that you as a programmer need to, to uh, compensate for this. So you need to write robust code that can deal with that the chaos monkey comes in and breaks things for you. So an awareness of that you have this chaos monkey means that you as a programmer need to do write better code. Uh, security, confidentiality uh, are things that are, well, not always looked at uh, that much. You, all this data, it's wonderful to have this big, huge data set and we can do all sorts of fun analysis on it, but well, if there is confidential information in there, then we need to do it in a different way. Uh, and that's, people are so focused on what can be done and how to do it that they don't think always about whether we should do it. And then when you run uh, your big data analysis, especially if you run Hadoop, uh, running Hadoop on a public network is a really, really, really bad idea, which I think I'll get back to later on the course. Um, but if you then run, need to run it as a private network or on a private network, well, then you have other uh, concerns about how to set up your firewall, how to configure it so that you can actually access what you need to access and so on. So uh, it's connected to security in some sense, but it's uh, on a different level. It's not the, about the data, it's about the application as a whole. Uh, because. Well, if we are doing a big data analysis, we're going to need lots and lots of machines and we're going to <clears throat> borrow or buy them or rent them from a cloud provider and they are going to be public. There's no ifs and buts about that. They are going to be public somehow. They're going to at least be available to the cloud provider. And then how do we secure them so that they only work with themselves and, and as I want them to work? That's going to be an important thing. That was actually my last slide. <laughs>